we're going to introduce our final storytellers, Aaron Wolf and Naomi Azar. Um, and this is awesome because they're um, a couple and they're telling a story uh, together. So it's, we're very so excited, excited about it. All right, everyone, please welcome Aaron and Naomi. <laughs> years old and I'm driving back from Colorado with my family. We've been on a family vacation. We're in this van. It's just chock full of people. There's four of us kids and my parents and it's like taking forever and I suddenly have this idea. I want to go horseback riding. So I turn to my family and I say, I want to go horseback riding. And my sister gets immediately annoyed. Naomi, ugh, why do you want to go horseback riding? Uh, and my mom is freaked out. Naomi, that is a great idea, but we don't know where those horses have been. And my dad is thrilled. I'm really telling you, this is a great idea. So we turn off the highway. Next thing we know, I'm there. But in my head, I'm picturing this whole time like a suburban sort of horseback riding place, you know, the kind with like the big circle in the middle and like someone's gonna be at the center because I've never gone horseback riding before and she's gonna like help me trot along in a circle. But actually we're in Colorado and the next moment I find myself sitting on top of a huge white horse. There's no saddle underneath me. The guy says, yeah, we ride Western here. So I have to hold on with one hand to the reins. And before I know it, he slaps the horse's ass and off I go. And the last image I have is this enormous grin on my dad's face. <laughs> because for my dad, there is no better way for his little 10 year old to learn how to ride a horse. Because for my dad, there is nothing that can make him prouder than a daughter who's willing to take a risk. That's because your dad's Iraqi and he has zero parenting skills. Which, <laughs> which is fine for her dad and it's fine for Naomi who's like a 10 year old ball of like energy and excitement. But I am a 30 something year old ball of anxiety and low grade depression. And so it doesn't work, that tactic doesn't work with me. Um, our honeymoon, we went to Brazil. Uh, Brazil was gonna be this grand compromise. I was gonna get Cosmopolitan Rio with its beaches and like good food and like restaurants and like bookstores and I was gonna be able to read quietly in a room and Naomi was going to get like risky Amazon with like piranhas and uh, all kinds of terrible grubs that we were supposed to eat for some reason. And I was willing to do it because our marriage is one that is predicated on being open to new experiences and compromise. And because I'm fairly certain that if I didn't, Naomi would find some curly haired yogi named Amos who was like totally willing to do all this crazy shit with her. And I'd be left at home with like a choose your own adventure book and internet porn. Oh, such <laughs> a sad image. <laughs> but a totally accurate image. So I do it. I totally dive into like Naomi's adventure world. And uh, Every like step along the journey, I have this like one distinct moment of like terror, and then I kind of like ease into it, and I kind of find myself kind of almost enjoying it. It's it's fine. It's good. I like it. And our last stop on the trip is going to be Salvador, which is this like coastal um, colonial city in in on, in the eastern coast of Brazil, and it's beautiful. It's like the architecture of these painted buildings, and I'm so thrilled to walk around the city with Naomi. And and then I open up the guidebook, and the, what I read in the guidebook. Is Salvador is one of the most dangerous cities in all of Brazil. <laughs> Which is like saying it's the douchiest city in all of New Jersey. Like they invented fucking dangerous cities. Like this is horrifying. And so I'm like walking the streets on full alert, like and um, Naomi is trying to talk me down and she's doing this thing that she does which is like, hey babe, you know, remember like every time you got nervous, it was always okay, right? And I'm like, yeah, it's totally okay, it's totally okay. And then we turn the corner and that's when I see in the midst of this crowd of people, a white man with no shirt on and no pants, uh, no, no shoes, wearing <laughs> pants, uh, <laughs> He grabs a Brazilian woman by the tit and punches her in the face in front of all these people and screams, you're gonna have to find somebody else now to lick your pussy. <laughs> it's all okay, Aaron, it's all okay. Well, let's be honest, that is not such a terrible mantra because it works. You know, when I was going with my dad to Jordan in Egypt, he took me on a trip and the first thing we did is we went to Petra. 
My dad, I'm too tired. So instead of walking with me for the day, he finds this guy, Mohammed, who's on a camel, who's Bedouin, who also doesn't speak any English, he only speaks Arabic. So the next thing I know, I'm on the back of this camel, Mohammed's in front of me, my dad looks at me and he goes, Naomi, it's okay, I, uh, he bought you on your camel, bye bye. And then off I go. And in my head, you know, it's like there's nothing that makes me happier than making my dad proud. So I trek off with Mohammed for the day. And we're getting further and further away from civilization. I'm just surrounded by desert. And Mohammed is starting to talk in rapid Arabic. And I'm just smiling and nodding. And I'm really not sure if I've just committed to having his babies. And it's scary. I'm like, how did this happen to me? I'm furious at my father, but I'm also slowly starting to become aware I'm in the fucking desert in Jordan. I'm on a camel. I'm with Mohammed. We're trekking for the day. I mean, like, this is incredible. And as we go through the day, I just, you know, I find I'm still alive, and I discover, like, I haven't yet been impregnated. And so <laughs> there are some, like, good things that are happening. And at the end of the day, I come down from the mountain. There's no one around. And then I spot my father asleep on a rock. And it was all okay. And it's exactly that feeling that would come over me when we would sit in our couple's therapist's office in the West Village. Because, you know, I love my husband. There's so many wonderful qualities about him. But this cautiousness thing, I mean, I do not understand it. And not only do I not understand it, it drives me crazy. She's talking about Joe, who is like the best couples therapist in the world, by the way. He really uh, is. I would recommend him to everybody here, but he moved. Um, and he, he, he was this like kind of genius character that would immediately get us like into our most like vulnerable spaces. Like immediately, like within 10 minutes, Naomi is sobbing about like how I've ruined her life and like limited her experiences. And I'm just staring like hate daggers at her like, you fucking bully, leave me alone. And, and we're facing each other in, our, in couples therapy. And it's always at the height where like, it's just like, there's no turning back that Joe would stand up and go, <clears throat> I'm just gonna go to the bathroom. And he'd walk away and leave us alone in this room, just staring hate at each other. He's breaking every rule in the book. He gets up and leaves. <laughs> Naomi's a PhD psychologist candidate, so like she knows everything. But okay, so <laughs> but in fact, Joe was doing something very uh, like intentional. What Joe was doing was he was creating space for us because as soon as he left the room, it was really hard to maintain that level of like just pure disgust at each other. And so we'd kind of just sort of turn it towards him and it worked. And <laughs> Joe would come back into the room and he'd talk about making space, about how like we have to make space for our feelings and then make space for the other person's feelings. And then once you make space for it, you might discover that like maybe your feeling wasn't even that right in the first place. <laughs> So back in Brazil, I'm trying to make space for my fear. And I'm also trying to make space for the fact that I've seen a sex tourist punch a prostitute in the face. But like, I'm fucking tired of making space. It's been two weeks of making space and I'm sick of it. I want to go back to our room and read. And <laughs> parenthetically, I'm reading like a Jose Saramago book because I want to get into like the poetry of like the Portuguese language. Naomi's reading Samba, a history of violent crime in Brazil as it relates to Samba music. Because even her book has to be like risky. So I turn to her and I say, Naomi, I want to go back to the room to read. But it's way too late because Naomi is wandering into an unmarked door in a dark building. And I say, what the fuck are you doing? And she goes, I hear drumming, which doesn't explain anything. <laughs> But off she goes, and I go after her, and I'm following her up this like kind of rickety stairs, and there's no lights, and it's dark and dangerous looking and feeling, and we turn the corner, and in this room is like hundreds of drums, and one dude in the center, and he's got long dreadlocks, and he's shirtless, and he's just like, buck, 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 buck. <laughs> and I have read the back cover of her book, so I know that he is an ax murderer. <laughs> and not only is he an ax murderer, but he's fucking almost. He's the guy that she's gonna go on her adventures with without me. And I'm fucking terrified. And he's going, gum, 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 gum. and he stops and he goes, if you come back in an hour, I will teach you a samba lesson. Which like is definitely code for I will make love to your wife while you wait in the hallway right now. <laughs> so I am kind of on like ah, and then to my horror, Naomi says, oh, sounds great. 
okay, we'll be back after lunch. And then she leaves. So it's fair to say lunch was tense, right? <laughs> lunch was a bit tense. And we are firmly in our arguing positions. I mean, my position. You have to try new things. You don't know what you like all the time. You have to try it in order to discover whether or not you like it. My position is, Naomi, I'm 30. I think I know what I like, okay? Because on the outside, I mean, on the inside, I am freaking out. On the outside, I'm like, I don't even like drumming. Yeah, and that's like what you do, basically. That is what I do. Still, you know. But, um, you know, I, I'm aware that like three months prior, I had taken these vows. You know, I had said, I vow to listen. And I vow to be cooperative and to compromise and all these wonderful things. And so I kind of know that I should be saying, God, babe, it must suck to feel so anxious. You know, <laughs> it must really suck to like be plagued by this anxiety and not get to have these new experiences. It must feel really bad. And actually what I'm feeling is you hipster fuck. I mean, why does everything need to be proven cool before you're willing to try it? What happened to you growing up? And I know that that's my dad. I mean, I know that I'm filled with this passion and I'm like, you just don't know what's good for you. You need to get on the camel, you know, because if you get on it, you're gonna love it, but you're never gonna let yourself get on it because it's not cool enough and it drives me crazy. And then the strangest thing happened. He decides to come with me to the class. And so I wasn't sure exactly. It might have been this primordial urge that kicked in, like, I am man, I must protect my woman. But I also kind of think it might have just been he was too afraid to be out on the street by himself. <laughs> it was that one. It was so scary. The streets are so scary. But either way, we both went to this class together and we go up those stairs and we enter this room and it's beautiful. The sun is shining in through the windows. There's drums everywhere. There's the teacher. He's totally wearing his shirt and he's immediately drawn to Aaron. So he gives him this huge drum. He straps it on his waist. He gives him these two drumsticks and he teaches him this basic beat. And Aaron is a musician, and he's a great musician. And so it doesn't take long before Aaron is completely lost in the music. I mean, he just picks it up immediately. And then the rest of us get our own rhythms, and then suddenly the room is filled with samba music. And we're rocking out, and we're loving it. And I look over at Aaron, and he's smiling. And I was amazed in that moment, because he just went from being this crazy, stressed out guy to being this like totally open, shining, enjoying guy. And that was incredible to me, that transition. The, the earliest memory, <laughs> I don't have an explanation for this. The earliest memory I have of my dad is uh, him taking me, my mom, my mom, he and I going to Disneyland. Uh, and we get in and within five minutes, he finds a bench outside of Cinderella's magic castle and he goes to sleep. <laughs> and my mom and I go on like, it's a small world after all and like all the rest of the stuff and like three hours later we come back and on the park bench next to Cinderella's magic castle is my dad still asleep, like a magic hobo or something. <laughs> and I always thought that it was because like he's this like radical intellectual character and you know, he'd probably rather be reading Pynchon than like going on the teacups or whatever. And that's totally plausible, I guess. But equally plausible is that he got to Disneyland and it was really crowded and there were five-year-olds vomiting everywhere and it was bright and he just said, fuck it, I'm out of here and just checked out. And I understand, like Disneyland is horrible. I would totally check out. But, you know, I don't want to be bullied by an Iraqi dad to force me onto a camel. But on the other hand, I also sort of wish that like every time Naomi had a cool idea, I didn't want to go to sleep on the bench outside of Cinderella's Magic Kingdom. We've always been different. We've always been different. The first time we met, Naomi was a raw foodist and I was a cigarette smoking rock and roll musician. He wanted to get married. And she was terrified of commitment. So like, we, we all have our shit, you know? And we broke up and we spent seven years apart and for some reason we got back together. And when we got back together, little things were different. She wasn't a raw foodist anymore and I was no longer a cigarette smoking rock and roll musician. Though I think we both sort of wish we were those things still a little bit. 
But something in, in that time changed in us, and I think that's what we find in each other now. I don't know how this ends. I don't know, I don't think either one of us know what is going to happen to us and how we're going to get over all of this. But I do know that we believe in the power of change, we believe in the possibility of compromise, and above all, we totally believe in couples therapy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>